Um, another concept is capital import neutrality. So uh, this is satisfied basically if all, if all of uh, the companies in Georgia are subject to the same tax rate. All companies competing or individuals competing in, an in, a, in the same market are paying the same overall tax rate. Um, and this is achieved a little bit more uh, closely if you have an exemption system where the U.S. just says, okay, to the extent you earn profits in Georgia, we see taxing authority based on territorial jurisdiction, uh, and therefore, you know, we will exempt whatever income you earn uh, from Georgia. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a capital import neutrality, uh, but is, you know, obviously at, at odds with capital export neutrality. Uh, because the U.S. taxpayer may be paying 30 or 20 or 10 percent in Georgia, whereas they'd be paying uh, 35 percent in, in the U.S. Uh, and then, of course, there's, there's, there's national neutrality. So from the perspective of the sovereign, from the perspective of the government, uh, we, we want all of this individual's activities to be subject to, to uh, uh, our tax rate. We want uh, to get our 35 percent. No matter what happens, we need to get paid 35 percent. We don't care if that makes the individual have to pay 70% or 150% on the transaction, uh, we want to get the same cut. And of course, uh, uh, that's, that's not normal uh, in, in international uh, tax. All right, so uh, my colleague discussed the, the, the two basic uh, jurisdictional tax situations, right, where you have, or the two types of transactions. You have uh, outbound transactions where we're investing in a, in a foreign country, and you have inbound transactions where foreign citizens are investing, in our case, in the U.S. Um, again, on outbound transactions, U.S. citizens are taxed on their worldwide income. And the U.S., uh, that's the starting point. So the starting point is you're taxed on all your, your worldwide income at U.S. rates, uh, the same as if you had earned this at home. Um, the U.S. basically avoids double taxation um, by crediting by, by the credit mechanism that, that we saw, um, that, that I just described just a little bit ago. Um, this credit mechanism, uh, again, says that the foreign country can assert its territorial tax jurisdiction, and then the U.S. provides a credit against the U.S. tax uh, by ceding primary authority uh, to, to, to the uh, foreign government. There are limits uh, on the, the ability to use this, this foreign tax credit. Uh, but basically, you can't start eroding the U.S. tax base by uh, uh, getting a credit for more taxes in a foreign country than you would have had to pay uh, in the U.S. Uh, and there's also limitations on the types of taxes that will give rise to a uh, tax credit. So it has to be uh, obligatory. It has to be a real tax, right? It can't be some sort of payment that you get reimbursed later on. It has to, uh, it has, so it has to be mandatory. It has to be an income tax. It can't be a royalty. It can't be something that, that's uh, disguised as an income tax, but really is not based on some kind of realization of income. Uh, so, so there are some limits on that tax. Uh, some of the key concepts for US companies when they are uh, investing abroad uh, that I've kind of alluded to already, but, but just to, to hit this point again, uh, are deferral, uh, deferral, uh, we call maybe a parking transaction, and then uh, pricing strategies uh, between related companies uh, to locate the uh, benefit, locate the, the, the gains in a particular jurisdiction. Uh, for d deferral uh, of income, basically uh, a U.S. company may locate some of its gains in a, in a low tax foreign subsidiary and again leave those gains in that low tax foreign subsidiary. Um, the U.S. has some mechanisms to try to prevent this from happening. It has uh, 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 parents called, uh, ha have uh, so-called subpart F income which tax some of your passive gains or those that are very easy to locate like from uh, royalties and so forth from intellectual property. Very easy. So where do you house intellectual property? Well, that doesn't require moving a factory overseas. That doesn't require moving a lot of people overseas. It's, you can transfer intellectual property pretty easily. So that's, that's one of the concerns for deferral in particular. And then pricing strategies, as I mentioned on the front end. You know, if a US company ha manufactures cars 
and then sells them to a subsidiary that ends up selling the car uh, at a subsidiary in a foreign country. The price paid by that, uh, by that subsidiary to the US company determines two things, right? It determines the gain for that foreign subsidiary. I, I, the, the foreign subsidiary, a, a company that, that has independent legal existence, is going to have gains to the extent that it sells the car or sells the product for more than it paid to the US parent. That transaction also dictates the gains that are going to be in the US uh, for the US parent, because that's how much the parent got over what its cost of manufacturing the car arms, the, the car is. So this is that that middleman transaction, that middle company transaction is what's so important in a lot of ways. And, uh, when you're dealing with some of these complex structures to house intellectual property overseas um, that Google and Apple and uh, Microsoft are, are known for now, uh, then it gets it gets very complicated, and it's hard, as you can imagine, to price these these transactions. When you're talking about foreign investment in the U.S., you know the question is how much income or I mean how much activity in the U.S. or what kind of activity in the U.S. is going to give rise to taxability for, for the foreign company operating in the U.S. And generally speaking, we, we look for, uh, for these companies that uh, are operating, uh, have operations in the U.S. Or, or derive gains from assets in the U.S. Historically, it was critical or, or it was a nice planning maneuver for foreign companies to use branches in the U.S which means not a real subsidiary, not a, well, not a US corporation with separate legal existence, but instead of, brand, uh, instead of just a branch uh, uh, operating off of the, the foreign uh, incorporation. Um, the US recognized that, that companies were using this strategy because it avoided, uh, in the US we have two levels of tax on corporations. Uh, so foreign corporations, well, we'll take the one level of tax uh, and then we won't ever ship the, the income back to uh, the, foreign com uh, the foreign country and therefore avoid the double level of tax, avoid dividends tax. Uh, now we have a branch profits tax uh, that eliminates most of, of the benefit of, of uh, that transaction. So whether you actually incorporate in the U.S. or operate through uh, the, the foreign parent company, it doesn't, doesn't really benefit you from a tax perspective. The benefit actually uh, now is to operate your U.S. to operate a U.S. formed company, a U.S. incorporated company, because that isolates the tax issues uh, from the U.S. perspective. You will have to file a tax return for the U.S. company, but you don't have to include in that tax return all of the operations of the parent company. Instead, you've isolated uh, that tax return to just the activities of, of that U.S. subsidiary. Whereas if you're operating through a branch still, if, if you haven't formed a U.S. company and you're a Georgian company or you're a, a German company, then the, the uh, issue becomes you have to, dis you know, if, if, you, if your activities rise to the level in the U.S., uh, your business activities rise to the level that you need to file a return, then you're going to have to include all of the information of the parent company uh, in your U.S. return. So it's, it's actually far better to, uh, for most companies to form a U.S. subsidiary now. Um, what do we look for for inbound transactions? What's going to rise the level of, um, of taxability in the U.S.? Well, basically, you need to be engaged in a trade or business in the U.S. Um, that uh, if, if you are engaged in a trade or business in the U.S. where you either have U.S. assets that, that are churning income for you or are actually you know, running and operating a business in the U.S., uh, then you will be taxed on your income that is effectively connected to that activity. We call that effectively connected income, or, or ECI. Um, and it's taxable as if you were a U.S. corporation. Um, you are also uh, uh, want to look at uh, intellectual property, has, has some very interesting issues uh, that, that, are, that are involved. And uh, we have to uh, uh, look at uh, what you know, level of housing intellectual property in a particular area will, will rise to, but uh, that gets a little bit complicated. Um, the U.S. also has this concept, we call it FDAP income. Uh, uh, so what you have for uh, certain types of income, 
that are generated from the U.S. Uh, from foreign individuals, for, for foreign individuals, are subject to basically an immediate 30% withholdings uh, tax. And this, is, this type of income is fixed or determinable annual or periodic gains, profits, and income. Uh, fixed or determinable annual or periodic uh, gains, profits, or income. So this is interest, <coughs> dividends, royalties, and rents, predictable streams of income that are passive. You're not, an act, you're not actually running a company over there. And this, the starting point, again, is that this type of income is subject to an immediate 30% uh, tax in the U.S. Um, this can be modified by treaty. Uh, the rate that's applicable on this type of, of income uh, can certainly be, be modified by treaty. Uh, uh, so uh, it's not an absolute rule, but this is the starting point. I mentioned the branch profits tax again, but you know now the point is really that it's uh, not no longer really favorable to, to operate a, a branch in the U.S. You don't have the tax savings that you used to have. Um, as my colleague mentioned, the source rules become very important. Obviously, if you're dealing with countries that uh, base their jurisdictional uh, authority to tax on the source or territory in which this income is earned, then we have to decide where that income was earned. Well, that's, sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's, it's not, right? So um, we, we have set up a, a, you know, a, a, a number of international norms and then also the U.S. has its own approach uh, to taxing each of these or, or determining where the source of each of these different sor uh, kinds of income will be sourced. Um, so you know, when you're dealing with interest, if you've got a, a domestic payer, Generally, uh, it will be sourced, interest will be sourced to the residents of the payor. Um, there are some exceptions to that. If you've got a foreign payor, then it's usually considered foreign sourced income. So interest is sourced where who's paying it uh, uh, is, is located. Uh, dividends, so if a corporation has earnings and needs to distribute them out to the shareholders, uh, if, if it's a U.S. corporation uh, that's that has the earnings and is making the distribution, that's usually U.S. sourced income. Um, if it's a foreign payer, then it's usually not U.S. source income. Uh, but depending on what level of business that foreign company is doing in the U.S., some portion of that income may be considered U.S. source income. Uh, personal services are easy. Where are you performing those services? Uh, and in fact, there are a lot of... Um, there are, that's something that's often addressed by treaty. Uh, so there are certain types of services that... Uh, or, or certain, you know... Uh, amounts of services, uh, certain um, uh, professions that are often exempted or excluded, their, their income's excluded uh, if they're not over in a, in a different country for too long. Real property, real estate, where, where's the real estate located? Any income from that will uh, be um, located there. Intangible pro uh, property, again, patents, trademarks, licenses, those things are very difficult uh, to, uh, to allocate from, from country to country. And we, we have pretty intricate rules for uh, allocating that, uh, that intellectual property. They're probably beyond the scope of, of, this, uh, of this discussion. But as, again, my colleague mentioned, the transfer pricing is, is kind of one of the hot topics right now uh, in international tax. And again, transfer pricing really uh, is uh, getting at um, what is the price that a company is paying itself for um, its uh, uh, for, for related in related party transactions, um, so we're trying to basically in, in uh, transfer pricing rules, we're trying to make sure those tax consequences are similar to the tax consequences that would be applicable in a uh, third party or arms length transaction. Uh, so, if a U.S. company is selling uh, its uh, selling automobiles that it manufactured to a uh, subsidiary located in uh, Germany, and then that German company is then selling the automobile. I don't know why the Germans would buy a US automobile, but if the, if the Germans uh, are, are uh, then reselling that automobile to an Italian, then again, that price that the German company is, is paying is gonna dictate both the gains that are taxed in the US and the gains that are taxed in, in Germany. Um, we have these concepts uh, in transfer pricing. We have, uh, you know, that the, the transaction must clearly reflect uh, the income attributable to, to in these controlled transactions uh, to prevent the avoidance of taxes. 
Uh, for intangibles, we have the concept of commensurate with income. Uh, basically, payments to a related party for a license or a transfer have to be commensurate with income uh, attributable to that intangible. And this is all based on arm's length principle. Uh, so what do we look at? Well, if, if you're selling cars around the country and you're also selling cars to, uh, uh, you know, if, you, if, if you're a company that manufactures and sells cars, uh, we might look at uh, if you sell them directly to U.S. citizens, if you sell them directly to uh, other, other countries, but then you also sell them to a foreign subsidiary, we might look at the profit that you make on both of those transactions. That profit should be roughly the same uh, to your subsidiary as it is to a foreign uh, corporation or, or a foreign individual. Uh, we might look at, at the price paid, the actual price paid instead of the profit and see if they're roughly equal or if there's something we can distinguish uh, th those based on. Um, so th those are some, some of the concepts that, that come up in, in tra transfer pricing. Again, this is an area where uh, the governments involved don't have the same interests, right? So uh, the U.S. and Georgia may get into a dispute over a transaction that ostensibly occurs in Ireland uh, because, uh, you know, Georgia says, well, um, you know, uh, the, the party involved from Georgia sh uh, was, should actually be paying less, uh, and the U.S. said no. That the party from Georgia should be paying more, so that more of the income is paid uh, is sourced to the U.S. or sourced to another jurisdiction. Again, the, the transfer pricing issue here. So I've got an example here. So if you've got a U.S. company, uh, in this case, uh, uh, I've got um, Cadillac. You know, as a maker of U.S. cars. Uh, if, if Cadillac sells to its Irish subsidiary, uh, and then that Irish subsidiary turns around and then sells the car to a Georgian, then you know whatever price that Irish subsidiary pays dictates not only uh, the, the income to the U.S. company but also to, to the Irish company. This is so critical because you know this is a good example. Ireland, Ireland has a 12.5 percent corporate tax, which is less than half of the U.S. tax on, on, on certain types of transactions. And this is why certain com companies like Google uh, are drawing so much criticism right now for, for their international tax structures. Uh, I don't know if you follow if, if, if you've seen the, the news about Google over the last few days. Uh, the, U, the Parliament and um, and uh, Britain and uh, the UK Parliament is a actually uh, you know called in the, the Google uh, uh, officers and directors and said you know. You told us that your uh, income from, from uh, UK activities is not located in, in uh, the UK, but instead is located in, in Ireland. And uh, the, you know, the, there's a lot of heated rhetoric over Google's tax strategy. Well, what does Google do? It, it does something called a, an Irish sandwich or a Dutch Irish sandwich, which is which is kind of fun. Um, the result is that basically Google had over, uh, what is it, over uh, 3.2 billion dollars worth, uh, three, I mean, 3.2 billion pounds of sales in the UK, sales from advertising. You, Google makes all of its money off of advertising on its website. But 3.2 billion dollars of sales in 2011 on which it paid taxes, through 3.2 billion pounds, I'm sorry, uh, on which it paid less than six million pounds in taxes. So it's, it's tax rates effectively nothing. Uh, how does it do this? Well, it's employing a similar strategy that Amazon uh, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, some other uh, technology companies have employed uh, in that area. Basically, what it does is it forms two Irish subsidiaries, uh, two companies that are legally located in Ireland. One of those, country, one of those companies is an Irish company that actually uh, uh, has an office there. You have a few thousand employees in Ireland. And all of the, the business, all of the advertising business from all throughout Europe goes through this Irish subsidiary uh, that's actually located in Ireland. The other Irish subsidiary that's incorporated in Ireland is actually located or housed, if you will, in Bermuda. Um, and then in between those two subsidiaries, uh, you have a Dutch uh, company, uh, a company formed in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, so. How does this work? Well, Bermuda has a zero percent tax rate, uh, and the Dutch, uh, uh, the Dutch have a, some nice treaties for moving money around, and also have a pretty good tax rate on, on intangibles. So, what Google did in 2006 
was negotiate with the Internal Revenue Service of the U.S. and say, okay, we need, uh, we, we have what's called an advanced pricing agreement. We're going to license out our intellectual property, the Google algorithm, right? All, what is Google? Google is nothing if not its, it's intellectual property, uh, which is, which is the, the, the search engine technology. Um, so what Google did in 2006 was agreed with the, got, got to an agreement with the IRS, an advanced pricing agreement, where the IRS agreed that Google could license its intellectual property, this, this uh, algorithm, to the company, to the Irish company operating in Bermuda in exchange for, for a license fee. And this rate, if you think about Google in 2006, it, you know, it certainly wasn't the, the dominant force that it is now, but it's still a, a pretty important company and now, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, does extremely well. Well, the IRS agreed to an extremely low royalty at this time to be paid to the U.S. Uh, in exchange for this license technology. Well, that means that um, there's a pretty low amount of, of income that's going into the U.S. Well, what, what does the Bermuda company do with this intellectual property? Well, uh, this is uh, the company that then licenses the intellectual property. It's got a license. It sub-licenses the intellectual property to uh, the, the Dutch company, and then the Dutch company then licenses, sub-licenses uh, the uh, intellectual property up to the other Irish company, up to the Irish company that's actually in Ireland. And what does this accomplish? Well, basically, the Irish company collects income all throughout Europe. All the gains throughout Europe are collected in Ireland, and then Ireland uh, uh, pays, uh, the, the Irish company pays taxes on that. It pays tax. It's subject to a top 12.5% tax rate, uh, uh, Google Ireland is, uh, on that. And it also, what does it do? It gets, to, it gets to deduct its payment, the Irish subsidiary's payment, to the Dutch company uh, that has licensed the intellectual property up to the Irish company. So basically, it can minimize the amount of, of, of you know, gain on the books by deducting uh, the, the payments for the intellectual property to, to, the, um, uh, uh, to the, the Dutch subsidiary, and then the Dutch subsidiary uh, uh, pays the fee to the Netherlands, which is subject to a 0% tax in the Netherlands, and, uh, and also the Bermuda. Uh, Bermuda has a 0% withholding tax. So I know it's a complicated structure, but through this, Google basically pays an effective tax rate of something, uh, you know, something microscopic uh, uh, on, its, on its international tax. Uh, on its international transactions. Um, which brings us to the next example, right? So that's Google. Uh, the, the other item that's been in the news in the past two weeks, I think, is, is Apple. Uh, Apple, uh, you know, computer company. Uh, and what Apple has, has been in the news for is uh, issuing $17 billion of new bonds. So Apple has, has gone out and raised a bunch of debt, $17 billion in debt, because it needs some cash. Well, Apple is one of the most cash-rich countries in the global. Uh, it has over $100 billion in, in cash, uh, but all that cash is sitting offshore. And Google's not wanting to repatriate it, not wanting to bring it to the U.S., because Google's in a situation like, uh, like uh, I'm sorry, Google, uh, Apple's in a situation like Google would be. Uh, when Google's uh, done this uh, Dutch Irish sandwich, it's got all this cash. That's where is it? That's in Ireland, right? Where's you know Google for the most part is located in the U.S. Um, so how does it get that money to, to the U.S.? How does Apple get the money to the U.S.? Well, if it pulls the money to the U.S., this hundred billion dollars that Apple has overseas, it's subject to a thirty-four percent tax rate. That's a pretty good haircut on, on the front end. Uh, so if, if Apple immediately repatriates that $17 billion that it needs for its operations right now, it's going to pay $5.8 billion in taxes. That's all good. Uh, so what instead it does is issue this, this debt, right, of the $17 billion in debt. And this debt is payable over, you know, they, they have, you know, four or five different types. It's, it's payable at low interest rates. Um, overall, Apple's going to pay about a billion dollars in interest on the $17 billion uh, that it's borrowed. Well, you know, $1 billion in interest is a, a significant cost, uh, but it, you know, sure beats paying fine, and it, but it can be paid out over up to 30 years, of some, some of the notes were up to 30 years, or the, the bonds were up to 30 years, and it also has the benefit of, of uh, you know, being uh, 
partially deductible. Um, and, you know, surely it's paying $5.8 billion a month. So that's the issue. So companies, even though they've got this cash overseas, it's not like they can't take advantage of that cash. They can, you know, uh, borrow elsewhere and still, um, you know, while it might not be ideal to pay interest that you don't have to, uh, it, it sure beats paying $5.8 billion in tax immediately. So uh, that's an example. The, the, uh, the intellectual property uh, discussion on, on Google, where you've got these licensing arrangements uh, in between the company, is an example of, of what we call transfer pricing uh, transaction, where you're trying to get the most benefit of the transaction, trying to locate most of the gains in a particular low tax jurisdiction. Whereas uh, th this other example of, of uh, you know, what happens after you have all of that, that income in a low tax jurisdiction, it just stays there, right? It's, it's maybe a, what we call a parking transaction. The US has a few mechanisms to deal with parking transactions where you basically, or you know, parking situations where you've left a lot of uh, cash in a particular jurisdiction. The idea is that, um, that uh, we may treat, the US may treat those, the individual shareholders of particular companies as though that income were distributed to them. If it's a certain type of income, if you have a, what we call a controlled foreign corporation, and we have subpart F income, we have certain types of, of income that's easy to locate offshore, then we will treat you as though you made a dividend uh, of that income, even though you didn't, even though that income's still offshore. So companies have to be pretty aware to, to avoid subpart F income. Um, on the transfer pricing side, we already mentioned it, that the US uh, and, and international solution to transfer pricing is uh, adjustment, a price adjustment. So on one hand, you, you have uh, immediate taxation as the solution for parking transactions. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the solution is a price adjustment. Uh, so, so those are the, the big, big issues. Um, uh, my my uh, colleague already mentioned the, the trade tree situation, uh, which I think is uh, helpful. Uh, but just to give you an idea of the types of, of, of things that the treaty uh, you know can provide, assuming that's acknowledged, uh, are you know an exemption for certain type broad swaths of income. Uh, the U.S. USSR treaty uh, exempts certain rental payments, uh, certain payments for engineering or architectural services, certain uh, broad types of, of industry that are exempted under this, and also, again, provides uh, for uh, uh, certain resolutions of disputes. So if you've got the US and Georgia uh, 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 disputing over whether uh, uh, a transaction that occurred in Ireland, again, uh, should be, you know, the price adjustment should be made different, uh, then we've got a, a dispute resolution mechanism built in there for that. Um, I think that's probably uh, all I, I should uh, do on the front end. Uh, with that, I think we're, we're both happy to, to take your questions. Uh, 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 uh,
Sakat 
I can give a, a little bit of the U.S. perspective uh, on that, um, at least uh, on intangible property, right? So in, uh, intellectual property, uh, IP, uh, uh, so gain on the sale of a, of a patent or a copyright or a secret process or a formula or goodwill or what have you um, is sourced depending on whether it's contingent, uh, depending on whether uh, it's fixed or contingent, uh, depending, uh, you might have some of those gains that depend on whether the company is successful and makes a lot of money with it, with the intellectual property, uh, like, a, like a royalty. Uh, or you, you might have some that are just, you know, we're paying you so much money per year for the use of this, whether we make money or not, uh, doesn't matter, we're paying you so much, like a lease. Um, so if, if you're dealing with, with contingent intellectual property payments, those are treated just like royalties in the U.S., which means uh, we, determine, uh, we, we determine the income is sourced where the property is used. So where, you know, depending on which jurisdiction is where the use is, it's a little bit difficult to nail down when you're talking about intellectual property, but that's, that's the idea. It, instead, you have fixed uh, uh, gain or fixed income and not contingent income on the use of an intangible, then the gains sourced by reference to the residence of the seller. This is exactly the issue that's in play at, at, with Google, right? Because Google says, look, you know, we don't make any money in, in, in uh, the UK, even though we have 3.2 uh, billion pounds of sales to the UK. We're not making that money in the UK, we're making that money in Ireland, because our intellectual, our intellectual property is licensed to our Irish subsidiary. That's where it is. It's where it's where it's protected, uh, and and uh, uh, or who owns that intellectual property? It's it's the Irish corporation that's located in, in Ireland. Uh, and the UK said, "This is crazy. You've got you know you're making all this money in the UK. You have people." What was very interesting is on some of this testimony in the UK, uh, people were you have what you call whistleblowers, right? People are saying. You know, UK is gutting our ta uh, uh, Google is cut, gutting the UK tax base. Uh, so, hey, by the way, we, we went by the U uh, by the Google UK office. They have an office in London, uh, and we know we talked to some of the people there, and they held themselves out as sales associates, and they have LinkedIn pages and Facebook pages that say that they're sales associates for Google, and they're located in London. Your salespeople are selling Google, selling advertising for Google in London. Therefore, this is, you know, British tax. And Google says, no, 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 no. This is, uh, you know, our intellectual property is all we have, really. And the only people authorized to take money and to close the transaction are located in the UK. So really, what you see is, you know, you, you can imagine what happens. The deal is negotiated and talked about. 
uh, and then you know the credit card transactions go through, you know, are routed through through Ireland, or maybe someone in Ireland signs off on, on the ultimate contract. But this is you know this is something that's coming under a lot of international scrutiny right now, um, and and uh, at, at kind of a bad time, right? Com uh, countries are are uh, competing for for this revenue uh, in a you know in kind of a down economy overall. But this is a huge source of, of, of potential revenue. Countries are, uh, on one hand, trying to pull in what they see as you know tax wrongdoers or tax cheats, and threatening them. You know, if you if you don't report this the way that we really feel like it should be reported, uh, then we're going to hold you accountable, or at least you know drag people in front of our uh, legislature and make you testify. Uh, on the other hand, you know the UK is also saying we really need to lower our tax rates. Right, we need to lower our tax rates enough that we can be competitive with the Cayman Islands, maybe not the Cayman Islands, but you know, competitive with, with certain low tax jurisdictions, certainly within the EU. So it's an interesting dynamic, you know, those, those two issues, you know, coming down on tax cheats very hard will scare people away from investing in your country or potentially getting tacked with investing in your country. Uh, and on, on the same end, um, uh, you know, they're trying to attract, uh, attract companies to, to locate, you know, London would be, would be very happy if everyone located their intellectual property in, in England. Uh, so if, if, if they were doing the same thing that I was doing. Dear Hertish, it was a two made our interest what American investor Protection from double taxation? Yeah. Well, in that case, what you, talk, what, what you described was a Georgian company um, uh, that is owned by a U.S. investor. Investor is American. But U.S. investor who forms a Georgian company. Which in turn invests, uh, operates in the U.S., has a branch in the U.S., but not a separate corporation. Yes. I, I, one, the U.S. investor, the starting place is, is the U.S. investor is subject to uh, income tax on the worldwide income. Uh, so any gains that the U.S. Uh, investor has starts off with, with the idea that, uh, uh, that, that uh, the U.S. individual would be taxable on that. But, now we've got what's the end of what who's making this money well is it the georgian company well the georgian company uh is going to be is it wholly owned by the u.s individual um then i think that would be a controlled foreign corporation uh and depending on the type of income i i, I almost am sure that's going to be sourced in the u.s uh depending on, on what the operations are uh, but i would guess that'd be sourced in the u.s for, for a variety of reasons either a, a controlled foreign corporation or um uh, uh, because the actual activities rise to the level in the U.S. Uh, it's operating in the U.S. Um, I don't think in that situation that the U.S. would grant a credit to the Georgian government or to, to the Georgian, well, it's a U.S. citizen, so I don't see the, the U.S. granting a U.S. credit to, to the U.S. citizen in this case for payment to the Georgian. Would, would Georgia tax the gains there of a Georgian company operating in the U.S. Um, Georgia probably, would, I would assume, yield territorial jurisdiction to, to the U.S. in, in that case. Um, but there may be, I, I, I would guess that, that Georgia would probably, uh, it would be on Georgia's side to, to either exempt that income or give it credit. Uh, Mr. Sakatos, <laughs> 
I might follow up on that as well. Just, I mean, you know, there, there are a lot of issues in, in play when you're talking about, you know, dictating your, your tax policy, um, you know, in order to attract foreign investment. Um, you certainly want to have a competitive rate. You don't want it to be a barrier to trade. But, you know, the bottom has been set so low now on our national tax. So, you know, are you going to compete with, you know, uh, Bermuda? Are you going to compete uh, with, with a zero tax jurisdiction? And what benefit does that, you know, what benefit does that do you? This is not talking about companies, you know, aside from Ireland. Ireland may benefit from having a physical location from, you know, a company like Google. Uh, but Ireland's, you know, 12.5% tax rate. Um, but you're not talking about relocating a lot of manufacturing. You're not talking about relocating a lot of employees. You're talking about just legal uh, structure and maybe some tax dollars. But you've got to set the tax dollars so low to attract uh, people to your jurisdiction that maybe the benefits aren't worth, um, you know, the, the gutting of the revenue from, from other perspectives. And then, you know, it's really a race to the bottom. Who else is going to be involved that's competitive that may have you know, a more developed economy, a more developed uh, 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 infrastructure from uh, from a financial perspective that, that will also compete for these dollars. Um, the other thing is, you know, these countries uh, that have extremely low tax rates are um, combined with bank secrecy, combined with, with, with uh, non-disclosure of, of bank accounts, are drawing a lot of international scrutiny. Um, and I think they're going to be the you know, the legal pariahs of the, the international community uh, in some regard. Now, that's fine if you can, you know, collect enough revenue to, to be on an island on your own. Uh, but, you know, as far as countries that are looking to integrate into, um, you know, in, integrate into uh, multinational organizations, I think um, that, you know, being perceived as a tax haven or being perceived as, you know, a, a, a you know, secretive, Banking uh, jurisdiction is, is not going to help uh, when you're talking about in integrating in, into those uh, um, multinational organizations. my question would be, uh, uh, what is actually being done to those countries which have very, um, very strict uh, banks here crystallized? You said they're like being pressed to you know chain them, like Switzerland or Bermuda, but what is in reality being done? Because I don't think there is a big development going on. So, thank you. Sure. So, what's being done in the bank havens in these these havens? Well, one thing that this all uh, in Switzerland in particular came out of uh, the UBS scandal a few years back. You might have heard about this, uh, and basically, UBS had a rogue employee uh, who. who um, uh, left the company, was fired, I can't remember, uh, and then came over and said, hey, uh, my job was to come to the U.S. Uh, every few months and to try to recruit high net worth individuals or companies uh, to, uh, you know, have these secretive bank accounts in Switzerland and disclosed all this information. Yes, he didn't disclose the names of the, the, the account holders but said, this is going on. And the U.S. said, you know, enough, you know, we are going to, the, the mechanism that the U.S. has whether it would actually be, I think it's, 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 the threat is out there, it's starting in 2014, I believe, uh, is that the U.S. will basically require a 30% withholdings tax immediately for, on, for, uh, for uh, entities, for financial institutions that refuse to apply, that, that refuse to comply with the disclosure of assets. So what the financial institution has to do is say, we have you know, citizens of your country that hold these bank accounts. 
uh, and the citizen has to do that. The, so one, on one end, it's kind of a pincer maneuver, right? On one end, the, uh, the U.S. is saying, you know, the uh, uh, financial institutions, you have to report this or we're going to re require you to withhold taxes on all, you know, transactions related with these individuals. Uh, the, the other end, individuals have the threat of, uh, depending on whether it's willful, whether they know what they're doing, uh, or whether uh, it's negligent, uh, the, there's a $10,000 per bank account penalty. Uh, uh, you might not have $10,000 in the bank account, but it's gonna be a $10,000 per account penalty. There's a penalty of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, up to 50% of the bank account in certain cases, and then criminal sanctions. We'll throw you in jail if, if, uh, if you haven't uh, disclosed these accounts. The problem is that, you know, the, the people you're going after, in large part, aren't tax cheats. There are people who may have, you said, uh, dual citizenship uh, that may not really be aware of, the, of these disclosure requirements and may have $5,000 in an account or may have you know, several different accounts set up. Uh, and so this threat of this disclosure, well, there, there's not a lot of flexibility in the rules right now. So yeah, maybe the institutions agree to comply, which is gonna cost them hundreds of millions of dollars to, to, to kind of set up this, this uh, reporting. Uh, system, which is also another complaint. But then the individuals, uh, the problem is that you're attacking these um, th these uh, individuals who may, uh, you know, not have the intent to avoid evade taxes, but instead were just uh, just had assets in jurisdiction. It, you asked about uh, a progressive tax. What would we call a progressive tax? Uh, are you talking about for corporations or for uh, individuals? Uh, you know, progressive taxation. I mean, the the, the U.S. Has had a love-hate re relationship with with uh, progressive taxation, but it's basically always had that uh, since 1913, since it adopted the modern income tax rate, right? very steeply progressive rates at one time uh, during the, the the first and second world war, up to 90 percent. Um, and the idea is, uh, yeah, there, there are different justifications for it, but you can you know more clearly. Um, uh, you can you can you can create a progressive tax structure that puts more of the burden of the taxes on the highest income individuals. Um, so uh, you, that's a more direct tax, but it makes it adds a lot of complication, and uh, you've got to set these thresholds and and and, and uh, justify. You know, people get very upset when I'm paying a thirty percent tax rate, and Professor Master Professor Simone is paying a twenty percent tax rate. You know, it's. Uh, and, and uh, you, you bring in deductions and credits and all these things that, that convolute what, what rate people are actually paying, and it gets it gets messy. So sometimes a lot of people think it's very clear to have a, a flat tax rate. Um, but there's a fairness aspect that's depending on what what uh, type of fairness you're you're, you're looking at. It, it may not really be. But, uh, that's the that's the idea. It sounds good anyway. <laughs> uh, Mimuni, go ahead. Sahakis, 